The Appalachian Mountains in the northeast of the U.S. are home to the National Radio Quiet Zone. The zone extends over 33,000 square kilometers, slightly bigger than Belgium, and has 600,000 inhabitants. Access to mobile telephone networks and Wi-Fi is restricted. This is because in the 50s, authorities built equipment for astronomy research and military intelligence here that can be affected by electromagnetic waves. This is the first telescope we had operational on the site. Uh, that was 1959, also known as the Table Telescope, since he basically designed it. Little teaching telescope off to the left. It's a little 40 foot. We have a group of students in right now. All right, so the next one, of course, is the Robert C. Bird Greenback Telescope. So it took them almost 10 years to build it. The lowest position of the dish is known as the snow dump position. Greenbank, a small town in West Virginia, is home to the National Foundation of Sciences Observatory. Scientists use the observatory to study the birth of stars, black holes, the Big Bang, and even the expansion of the universe. Its mobile telescope is the biggest of its kind in the world. It's popular with astronomy researchers, and there are over 500 scientists who use it every year. Dane Sizemore is a local. He's been a computer engineer at the observatory for over 10 years. This is basically his second home. His parents worked here, and as a teenager, he did odd jobs in maintenance. Today, he's checking the telescope computer program. But yeah, everything looks fine here. There's nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, which is always nice to see. Usually when I'm in here, there's a, a problem. <laughs> so I, I like it when I'm here and, and, and everything is, is going exactly the way I think it should. Honestly, there's a ton of, of work to maintain a, a, a system this complex and this large. And we've got, uh, yeah, the operators, the mechanics, uh, electrical people, electronics folks, um, the science staff gets involved too for testing and validation. It's really a team effort and uh, software is just a very small part of it. It's really, um, um, I'm very fortunate to work with an with a excellent group of people all over the, the site to, to maintain, uh, maintain the GBT and to, to do science. <laughs> Dane's still fascinated by the technological feat of this giant machinery. He takes any opportunity to climb to the summit. So this is the, my favorite spot on the site, just because it's, uh, you can't beat the view. <laughs> Greenbank was chosen as a site for several reasons. One is the, the mountains uh, themselves. As you can see behind me, we're surrounded by mountains, so we're, we're protected by the mountains from television stations, from radio stations, from cell phone towers, things like that. Along with that, they also wanted a place that was remote, so it was away from the potential interference from uh, large cities. The third criterion they wanted was a, an area that wasn't likely to be developed knowing that not only would it be radio quiet now, it would be radio quiet for decades to come. In this area, nicknamed the Quiet Zone, other telescopes search the skies too. These are a part of Sugar Grove, a military base belonging to the National Security Agency. After being kept confidential for a long time, its program of global surveillance financed by the American government was revealed by Edward Snowden in 2013. Along with other military sites, the Quiet Zone allows the USA to spy on any citizen in the world, anywhere, at any time. Nothing we're looking at is man-made. I think that's probably the biggest distinction. The folks at Sugar Grove are wanting to, to look at other man-made objects and, and listen for, for signals and, and, a, and a national security context. We're we're listening for stars, we're listening for galaxies, we're, we're looking at things that aren't man-made, we're looking at, at nature.
The zone is also a refuge for hundreds of people who are hypersensitive to electromagnetic waves. Like the astronomers, they dread these waves, but for a different reason. Melissa Jenkins is from Colorado, and she moved to the quiet zone three years ago. Now I'm looking back and I'm realizing that maybe the reason I've moved so many times in my life is because I get settled in and then I realize that things were bothering me and I just had this, this urge to leave, you know, because I'm so sensitive now. So and I think this has been going on for at least 25 years, maybe longer. So I packed up all my stuff and I island hopped to Maui. Maui was worse. And then I started coughing and having symptoms of sinus stuff and just coughing and coughing. It was this uncontrollable cough. And I got to the point where I thought, you know, I think I'm not gonna make it. My assistant had her cell phone up there and she said, there's something here on my cell phone, it's called Green Bank. And it has this telescope and so it doesn't have any cell phone. The quiet zone saved my life. I don't think I'd be alive if I were still in Maui. It's beautiful here. I can smell the grasses and I can hear the birds. I can think because I don't have the cell phone frequencies. I miss Colorado, I miss Hawaii, I miss, but I, I probably cannot go back. Hello? All we have Melissa has been living with Diane Sho, one of the first electrosensitive people to move close to Greenback. Diane now suffers from multiple sclerosis. In exchange for accommodation, Melissa, who is an experienced carer, cares for Diane. And she seems to want to eat, so I'm giving her the shot. Hey. Diane extensively researched electromagnetic waves and their effects. She is now seen as a spokesperson for the community of people who are hypersensitive to these waves. Well, I started the research just for survival. What was harming me? What do I need to avoid? And how can I make a safer place to live? I traveled over 200,000 miles looking for a safe place here I am at Green Bank, now how do I make this house safe? We tried to find ways to make the house safer. Hey Diane, let's measure. I am very reactive to electricity. I'm reacting into what happens when we plug anything in. And right now I just can't really tell a difference. I just feel icky. This is just part of my life. When they built this house, they put all the electricity that was coming from outside into conduit. Um, all through the walls, it's, the um, electric lines are in conduit, which is, it's made out of steel, I believe. Correct? Something that's not very conductive. I'm going to plug it in. Electric kettle, most people have an electric kettle. Electricity is in the conduit right now, and um, it's very safe. But look what happens when I give it an outlet. Dirty electricity is coming through here, so whatever this was controlling in the conduit is now coming out through here. This does not have conduit on it. This is just plastic, right? And it, so it's a very poor insulator. So I'm gonna just unplug this. There's nothing, there's nothing in the conduit. Nothing is coming out of this, um, a little bit of electricity here, but not a lot. So, but this is not a poor person's disease. If you're going to be this sensitive, and you need money. Now, I'm trying to get on disability because obviously I can't work as an RN down there anymore. I mean, I can't do that. So um, I've been going from doctor to doctor, and I asked her, you know, we've been together for three years, and you've heard all my goofy stories and stuff. Can you diagnose me with microwave syndrome? And she said, literally, she threw up her hands, and she said, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I don't, I, I don't do that sort of things because I'm not the expert. The U.S. does not recognize the symptoms that electrosensitive people suffer from. 
Melissa's chances of receiving a disability status and the benefits that come with it are slim, leaving her future uncertain. Not everyone is electrosensitive like Melissa, nor do they respect the rules, which is why Chuck Nide relentlessly hunts down sources of radioelectric interference. Every week, he finds Wi-Fi networks and all kinds of devices that emit waves that could affect the telescopes. The authorities don't want anyone to own these devices. This was still feasible in the 90s, but not so much in the 21st century. Well, as we drove by the high school football field, a new, a new to me Wi-Fi hotspot popped up that says, and there it goes, PCHS football. So someone's put Wi-Fi in down there. Eagle, there's, there's nothing we can do about that. It seems like every house, every building, every business has Wi-Fi of some kind. And I've, I've been out uh, in remote rural areas where there's really nobody out there except cows and you'll come across a little house back up in a field somewhere and they will have Wi-Fi, it'll be there. It's always a mystery, sometimes it's, they're getting it by satellite, others it's from the local phone company. We don't have the authority to go out and tell people they have to shut down their equipment. I would still call it a quiet zone because compared to everything outside the zone, it is quiet. It's not as quiet as it used to be, but it's a lot quieter than a lot of other places. Chuck is content with recording the illegal Wi-Fi networks that surround the telescope. Anyone breaking the rules can be fined, but the observatory is tolerant so as to stay on good terms with the residents. In the quiet zone, people have to travel long distances to go shopping, see friends, and then get back home. Dane and his wife Hannah commute back and forth between the observatory and their house every day. Hannah Sizemore is a researcher at the Institute of Planetary Science. At the observatory, she studies the frozen ground on Mars. Like Dane, she is originally from the region. She never thought she'd come back to live in the quiet zone one day. What? <laughs> Their children are growing up in an environment full of science and nature, but the couple are well aware of the challenges of their lifestyle. At night, and I woke up expecting to feel great, but I was not feeling great. <laughs> um, I mean, it was just wonderful. We just spent our lives Note that climbing trees and climbing rocks and wandering around, building little cabins and making dams in the creek. And it was just I'm like a fairy tale. It was hard to be at school at Hillsboro. Um, but we lived in a bigger world, a world that was full of books, a world where we traveled out of state, a world that we had friends who traveled internationally, and um, just, just a different worldview, different life experience than so many of my classmates. And a lot of kids were coming from really, really difficult homes. Um, actual poverty. There is an acknowledgement that I have to admit to myself that, yeah, there are also some, some serious problems. West Virginia is, is at the bottom of, of, the, of let lists of states in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of all of these different metrics that I, I wish we were better at. I, I want them to, to, to be better at. And, and yeah, it, that, I think that's part of the contradiction of living here. We are really protected from all of that by an economy that hinges on tourism, natural beauty, and science. That said, there are unique challenges to anybody coming in here 
to make a business. And, and one of them is the quiet zone. I mean, you remove the observatory, there's just that much less. In West Virginia, the decline of the steel and mining industries has led to instability for tens of thousands of families. Without proper connection, new businesses are often reluctant to set up in this already geographically isolated region. This is the dark side of the quiet zone, where drugs and poverty have become part of the landscape. Samantha Madison and her family are from Marlington, a town in the quiet zone with a population of 1,300. 42% of the population here live under the poverty line. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Sammy. Yeah, you're welcome. See you later. And you have to have a good day. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. They once lived in an isolated house without any means of communication. To get internet, they had to move. Now Samantha, Samuel and Austin hope to start a new life. My life's um, really dark, my story. I've been through a lot. I lost my husband um, due to drugs. And I had left and went to a refuge center because they got abusive on the methamphetamine and I was an addict myself. There's not much to do here. It's a beautiful place, but there's no job opportunity, and there ain't much to do other than, you know, <laughs> drugs or party or... I went from my daughter telling me, I hate you, Mom, to Mom, I love you. Mom, I'm proud. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I've got my son living with me now, and. Life's a lot better. I don't want my kids to have to worry about me. I don't want my kids to have to bury me. I actually miss the nature and the solitude and the quietness and stuff, but it's easier for me to be here where I've got friends all around me. And, and that helps with my addiction. That helps me you know, just to realize that I'm not alone. I can get like, um, I could talk to my daughter. Now I can get on the phone and talk to her. Or she can message me on Facebook or, so it does help. It helps with like with my, being able to communicate with my daughter and stuff while she's in college and. Still in the quiet zone, but in another universe, are former hippies who moved here in the 60s at the height of flower power. So how do we get, so we're gonna do two sides and then come inside? This is the case for Danette and Michael. They met at the beginning of the 70s while fleeing New York and Chicago to lead a life closer to their ecological beliefs. Otherwise, I think it will get caught up either in the lawnmower. Every day, the couple work hard to harvest the best produce possible. Their two sons and their family, who live in the region, help them out. That was the main goal, community and being able to be self-sufficient. Part of homesteading and being self-sufficient is that we're living in food desert, where there's not a grocery store nearby. I think you've already experienced that up in Green Bank where you can't find fresh food. And that's what life is. We don't need to, processed food is full of chemicals, it's dead food. So eating something that you pick out of the ground. I mean, 
watching your kids walk out and pull a carrot out of the ground and kind of sluck the dirt off it and start chomping at the sugar snap peas. I mean, we would have like hordes of kids just grazing in the garden. That's the way it's meant to be. But their motto, centered around self-sufficiency, doesn't bring in enough money for the family to live off. They've had to find work elsewhere to meet their needs. So I ended up finding a job at this hot tub factory a half mile south in sales because that had been my background before some of the other stuff I'd done. So I worked there in sales and then I got recruited by my midwife, who later I practiced with, to work in a domestic violence shelter sexual assault center. So I did that for a while. So after a while I stopped doing that and just did the midwifery and all the autoimmune stuff went away and I've been great since. Danette and Michael regularly meet up with younger people who live in the quiet zone. A neighboring community center promotes these exchanges between different generations. It's not gonna be, so the normal version, the normal way of making a fast water is you just said Biba. My mom has been really worried um, because we don't have any cell service on that side of the mountain. That's but right. We came here last week and they had Starlink here. And Erica told me that they were able to get the mobile version of it. It's like a um, rectangular flat white thing that is a satellite dish and you, you put it on a surface and then it'll rotate itself to find wherever where the star the satellites is. are in wow. the sky kind of thing and we wanted to have a like a blog for our farm like a facebook page mm -hmm. and um so now we have the potential for doing that which is good um not that i have time to do that yeah for decades danette and michael kept new technology at arm's length but, in the end, technology got the better of them, for professional reasons. I drug my feet on a smartphone that had all the extra features. I just wanted to be, have someone to be able to call me. But then, as my clients got younger and younger, they wanted to text me. So I tried to make it that, you know, people could contact me whenever they wanted, and that's where this... That's when I got the smartphone so that they could text and I could text them back. So the Quiet Zone does offer a buffer from as much technology, but even they're having a hard time. People um, disobey the rules up in the Quiet Zone and they have Wi Fi and things like that. The Quiet Zone's even compromised. So I don't know. Despite being stuck between a heavily criticized military surveillance program and Wi-Fi networks that are invading an area that's becoming less and less quiet, there are still quiet zone residents who believe that a future without electromagnetic waves is still possible. <laughs>